Now there's confidence. Yeah. <laughs> so let's give the ladies a big round of applause for lunch. Yeah. You know, I go to lots of conferences. <laughs> they always feed really well. I really enjoy it. Uh, yeah, I was excited uh, in August to come up. Uh, I met Kevin Elmy at the airport. He picked me up and we toured around on some farms uh, the day before the conference. Had a great day there. Great day at the conference and, uh, and it was uh, really enjoyable to be here. Uh, and I was more excited when she called me back and uh, had the, the great lineup of Jay and Chris uh, to be with me here today. You know, so we have the conservationist, the planner, and we have me. <laughs> then we have the scientist, the PhD, that's, that's really uh, tells the big picture as well. Uh, both of these have been my mentors for years. We shared conferences, we shared ideas. I've been to Minokin Farm probably three, four years straight for a little while in the, in the conservation district program there too as well. So it's not like I don't know them. We, Chris and I just got back from Acres Conference in uh, Kentucky this past week. Uh, has been a busy week, so I, I farm and ranch it, as well. We've been in a D3 and 4 drought uh, all summer, all year. Uh, we actually hit a new low this summer, the driest uh, even in the 30s uh, in western Oklahoma where I live. Uh, so challenging, challenging, but once again, uh, why wouldn't I plant a cover crop? And I did. And, and now, uh, half of that died during the drought, but I still had half, Jay. And, and that's the important part. And then we got some moisture, things got a little better, and we've been receiving some uh, moisture here. Not a lot, but enough to keep us going. And, uh, you know, if you get things right, that's, that's what matters. So <clears throat> this, I'm gonna do two things right here before Chris talks. Uh, this one is grazing beyond the yield. So how many of you are ranchers or run animals to graze? Okay, good. How many of you are grain farmers? How many of you are both? Okay, so I'm both. I used to talk, you know, grain, then we had cattle. Since I started down this path 12 years ago, and I think Jay was at my farm probably eight or 10 years ago, uh, I changed that mindset. Now that we're in this climate environment, you, you know, you can call it climate change, you can call it adverse weather, the meteorologist in the climate hubs that I work with at USDA now refer to as whiplash weather. So one extreme, other extreme. No fall <coughs> weather, it's hot, cold. Heavy snow, heavy rain, drought, it's just knee jerk type weather. So that's the reason we want to build a system that levels that out somewhat. You know, we don't want to do this. If you're in a market, you don't want to, normally I buy here, miss this. And that's what we want to do with, with the weather. We want to try to smooth that out a little through the resilience. So grazing beyond the yield. The old way or the better way? I grew up in this system, much like Jay talked about. My, my great granddad brought my granddad to the farm, the headquarters uh, in 1926. They had so many kids that they named two sons Marvin. <laughs> you, you can't make this stuff up. I always knew my granddad signed his business as MC, but everybody called him Curtis. Well, the reason was his name was Marvin, but then I also knew Uncle Marvin. 
And so what happened in, in 26, they had uh, 12 kids at that time. Granddad took three sons and three daughters, loaded them up on the train, come up from southern Oklahoma, and the mission was, we got to find you somewhere to go to make a living besides here. Granddad knew, found this place to rent. He said, this is where I want to be. His dad gave him enough money to pay rent for two years, a little starter kit, pat on the back, and away they went. He took Uncle Marvin uh, to L.A. They went to California. He found the farm south of L.A., which now has houses, by the way. And then Uncle Bascom went to Yakima, Washington. And the girls never found men or a place that they liked in that big round adventure. And you can imagine in the 20s, uh, what an adventure to take your kids all across the country. He brought them back to Oklahoma City, said, get a job, get a man, get something. <laughs> You're on your own. Give them some money and, and went back to the farm. So I grew up in this scenario. The field that you see on the right is right there across the road. There's a county road right here. A uh, good friend of mine went to high school with him. Uh, he told me once about these <coughs> ditches, and these are small ones in his farm, on his farm. He said, them dang ditches. I got I to fix them. I said, you know, the problem is not the ditch. It's what was in the ditch. That's the problem because it's gone. Sadly, he still doesn't get it. But we started no-till in 1995, and uh, with good success, as Jay showed the charts today, you can, you can do some good things with, with no-till versus this. But then we reached that plateau. You know how Jay's bars just lined out? And I couldn't get through it until I heard David Brandt talk. David really inspired me to do better. Henry Ford once said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would set a faster horse. We talked about this earlier. If you were plowing with horses, you know, you either want more of them or bigger ones. Uh, that's what happened. We, we done a good job of that. My granddad on the 250 acres of the river bottom along there at the bottom land, he never farmed all that back in the early days. I was like, Hey, Granddad, why didn't you farm that? He said, you walk behind a horse all day, all summer, and you'll find out there's only so much you can plow. <laughs> and uh, that, that controlled that de degradation, really, and, and helped us some. So a new day on the Emmons Farms, we started. We started in 2011, uh, I mean, that was a big drought year for us. That's a good time to plant cover crops. Uh, <laughs> Everyone told me, Jimmy, you can't do it because we're in an arid environment. We get somewhere around 20 inches of rain, give or take 20 inches. And everybody said, yeah, you're being silly. Well, in 11, we had 9.2. In 12, we had 6 point, no, 7.4. In May of 14, we had 24.3, the month of May. So literally, we can give or take 20. This is the first season of cover crops here. You can see they're stressed out and they're kind of dying. We got a water probe sensor here and a temperature. This is my conservation district gal, Colita, still here. I work for the commission part-time. This was a... Another mentor of mine, he's passed away now. Uh, I've got a new boss. Here's a soil scientist, extension agent, and my, my other soil scientist are over in the background here. Jay and I talked about this yesterday. I had a really good team that's helped me advance a long ways in 12 years. And because of that, we found out lots in a short period of time. We kept this square bare because that's what everybody at home would do in the summertime behind grain. They would plant, they wanted rid of the residue, they wanted to be able to plant clean in the fall and it was so pretty. That's, I heard that all my life, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty. Well, 
artists look at things differently. How, what we perceive as pretty. But here's the game changing that really got to us. And when people told me that we didn't have enough water to grow cover crops, they were actually right. Because when we measured our first fields of infiltration rates 12 years ago, we were at a half inch per hour. We're exceeding 10 inches an hour now. Once we got our aggregation and the stability of it fixed, when we do get a rain, I get it all, Jay. I really do. And, that, and that's what's really important. So the next spring, this almost died, we terminated that, we planted wheat in the fall in this field. And the next spring, see that square? Mm -hmm. Once again, Noble Research helped me, this is Jim, here's my DC with the NRCS, me in the hat. Jim said, what in the world is going on in this square? He was at the field day that, that summer before. And I said, I don't know, you're from the Research Institute. <laughs> <laughs> I fed you good lunch. <laughs> so he went and got a, a testing probe and started probing in here. And he said, Jimmy, you have a hard layer. You got a plow layer down about so deep. Mm, no. Eh, wrong answer. I know my soil. So he went out here, started probing, and the probe would go all the way into the T-handle. Almost stood him on his head when he'd done a couple of them. He's like, wow, that's, uh, what, what, do you, what do you think? So we called the next NRCS, bring out a Giddings probe, pull a two-inch core, and this is what we found. Where we had bare soil at 16 inches was a dry layer. This was the surface. Where we had cover crops, it was 33 inches. They took that back to the lab, weighed it, dried it out, reweighed it, and then it told us the moisture content. So where we had no covers, 4.6 inches in the profile, and where we had covers, it's 7.52. Guess what? I'm all in. It was not what we expected at all. Even me, I had proved to myself that this was true. But now I am a cattleman. So the next year, we grazed it. And then when we measured it in September, guess what? We were where we had cover crop lower on moisture versus where we didn't. You know why? Because plants use very little water when they're small and immature. When they go into reproductive mode, they go to using more water. And if we're going to graze through the season, guess what? In a multi-species mix, you're going to have plants that, that are in reproductive mode. But when we come back in the spring, we're water ahead. Why? Our aggregation was growing. We were being able to take it in when it comes. Plus, I took this grazing, the first time I measured that, we took $115 an acre in beef per acre. So I don't mind using a little water if I'm going to yield profit. Because the banker says, I'll make you a great rate. I'll set you a good terms up. You may not have to zero it out, but you need to show the ability to. And do it. That started allowing me to grow cover crops and return some of that investment in soil and moisture, but also financially. It was a real game changer for us. So we figured out we may use a little more water, but when it comes, before harvest out here, we were always water ahead in the end, when it came, because we had the ability to take it in. So important if you're in an arid environment. And guess what, with changing weather, we're all gonna be in an arid environment. 
one time or another. It, it, dew may not come every, every morning. We quickly learn if we could keep it covered, keep armor on the ground, and keep a living plant growing, no matter how big or how small, we could keep it right around 80 degrees. And by the way, the surface, the ambient temperature that day was a little over 100, about 106. This is from the summer. If you looked at my neighbor's field, it was 130. Now, if you're in Oklahoma and it's 106 degrees and you have a flat on the asphalt <coughs> and you want to change a tire, it's probably in that range or up here. But if you can go limp over to a tree off the side of the road and change it and you're in this environment, which one would you rather work in, here or here? Well, it's a no-brainer. The soil biology is the same way. I don't care if you look at an elephant, or we're going to show you here in a little bit, a microscopic entity in the soil. They all have to have air, oxygen. They all have to have something to eat. And they got to have an environment to work in that's sustainable and livable and breathable. So, another great soil scientist that's worked with me for years, Greg Scott. <clears throat> We're southwest of me at home, Alan Mindemans. This is sand rock in the bottom. Not very much soil to work with. If you could really see in here that darkening layer right here, do you saw this in one of Jay's slides a while ago? That's the carbon that's moving down from the plants, the exudates. How important that is, you just can't imagine. And what we see in our environment in that corridor of 20 inches, give or take, if you do a complete system with animals in it, we can see that darkening layer moving down about an inch per year. Allen's been about 20 years it's about 21 or 2 inches. We were down in North Texas, at, and Nicole Masters was down in the pit. And I was looking at the bank there. I asked the gentleman that, that owned the ranch, I said, how long have you been doing adaptive grazing, multi-paddock grazing, and managing for soil health? He said, about 18 years. So I said, Nicole, how, how, how deep is that darkening layer? And she said, I don't know, but I got a tape measure. 19 inches. So we know, and, I, and that's just a few examples, uh, everywhere we go we see that. The drier you are, the slower that's going to be. The wetter you are, the more you can grow, the faster you can do that. And I'm sure that's the way it is at Minoka. You live in Utopia. So, <laughs> so, so shortly after we got done with the field day, it come a big downburst to water. I mean, it just a deluge in just a short period of time. If you noticed around the pit, there's no way water can run from the surface into that pit without it being this deep on the surface. So how did that water get into the pit that quick? That's right. It come down, earthworm burrows, Soil aggregation, really, really good soil health. It goes down, and it'll come out least resistance. So an open pit was least resistance. And I mean, it was just squirting in, into that pit. It was really something to see. So I travel a lot. I do a lot of these. Someone asked me a while ago how much uh, this year, this is going to be my last outing before uh, January. Uh, I'm on about day 200, so been a busy year, plus farming. So then you're not really farming. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is really <laughs> So we measure our infiltration rate. This is a mini disc infiltrometer. Works off connectivity. There's lots of ways to do that. We've used lots of, of these. We can move uh, that too and make it go faster. This is Jim with Noble Research. We're watching it, you know, a little wind that day. 
a good tool, a good tool. We also... Our first inch took two minutes and two seconds. We're on our second inch of water now and we're right around 20 minutes. So that means we could easily take a two inch rain that occurred in a half an hour. And while those events are rare, they do occur. Uh, those extreme two inch per half an hour, four inch per hour rainfall events, three inch per hour rainfall events, and this soil would take that all in uh, rather than letting it run off. And that would go to refill an aquifer, refilling the profile and not uh, contaminating stream water with nutrients and, and loading downstream. Yeah, absolutely. It has a lot of effects for the downstream. This was five years and, ago. Uh, as now well that, as that rate's a lot higher. Uh, than so I try, this is in Tennessee, Adam Doherty. I am standing. I've been accused of squatting on my knees. <laughs> uh, tremendous, tremendous soybeans. They, they call this field the Holy Grail. It's it, this producer, like some of you in the room, that does a great job with cover cropping and animals. Good rotation. Even for a corn and bean guy, he's got a good rotation. <clears throat> It's just amazing. Now, once again, when I said you could do more with more, the more rain you get, the more you can. So Jay was talking, he saw his cover crop of rye about this tall. Rye down there will be this tall. 10, 12,000 pounds. When I pull the beans back where I was standing, you can look at the rolled cereal rye on the ground. What a great mat, sponge, so to speak. No weeds, no weeds. <coughs> weeds cannot germinate if they have the armor on the ground. They've got to have sunlight to be able to, to germinate and grow. If you keep that shut off and you only open up a little trench and drop a seed in, it works very good, a lot better than a chemical. So if I take that residue and I pull that back, well, that's coming. Sorry. So another good friend of mine, Rick Clark, we're going to talk about the biomass. I forgot about this part. So cereal rye and, and nutrients. What is it cereal rye really worth to you on the farm besides armor, weed protection, sponge? It's also about accumulating nutrients for you. So Rick done a big study over the past couple of years of the nutrients in the biomass. So 12 inch rye, and he done, he done this every few days. I'm going to show you how the, how the cover crop grew. So 12 inch rye has 82 pounds of N, 15 of P205, 32, you can go right on down through there. And that's a, in the 2,000 pounds of biomass. Now, if you're in a limited rainfall, that may be all you get. But guess what? What if you get a lo localized shower and you can grow to 18 inches? You can double the biomass, but look at the pounds of N, P and K, and all of the micronutrients. Sulfur, Jay talked about that a while ago. Just in that short period of time, and 28, Rick's in Indiana, look at the biomass here, and look at the nutrients that he's sequestering in that cereal rye. Now, I'll show you the dates on this in a minute. He got busy because he's a farmer. He come back and in the plots, he looked at the dry biomass later. How it shrank, you know, the biology is consuming things, but look at the nutrients still in that taken two months after the termination. So then the, it, the power of the true cereal rye is going to be in dollars. How many of you bought nutrients this year? <laughs> Takes a line of credit. <laughs> Maybe with no limit. I didn't think I asked the question. <laughs> yeah. So if you had 12 inch rye 
And you had all these nutrients and these prices were at, at this summertime this year. Look at look at totals per acre. This there. That you don't have to buy. But then look at the 18 inch. And the 28. 400 bucks. So see, there's more to this than just a cover crop. And when you're looking at them balance sheets, it, it, it matters what them producers are doing. And it matters to me. The dead dry still had $200 an acre, still in it. So 100 pounds of rye, Rick plants a lot, because he's got water to do it with, $29 an acre. And that N was figured at a dollar a pound. The P and the K figured at them. That was the numbers that how he arrived at that. And that was May of 22. The Salma fixation clover. Look at that. Look at the biomass. He, once again, looking every every two weeks. Look at the biomass, how it's growing. But look, see the peak here when you're getting the most? Guess what's happening here? Heat's starting to come. It's starting to terminate out. It's on its down cycle. Organic carbon, it's important. Carbon is the key. A 20 to one ratio. Now, the power of cocktails, and I've seen cocktails are in the list the insurance wall ago as well. So on May 20th, look at the end. Look, look at all, all the nutrients that's in this cover co cocktail as they continue to grow. Look what they can do for you in nutrients. Once again, you get up here and you get matured out, things start going the other way, but still a big value. The cover crop cocktail cost him about $33 an acre, but look at the benefits here. In nutrients alone, besides fixing your soil and storing carbon, <coughs> aggregation, the, the big picture. I mean, everybody wants to fixate on the dollars anymore. But this is how you can grow for a very little, a lot of profitability in your farm. And when we talk about cutting back on synthetic fertilizers and chemicals, but cover crops, this is how we can do that. So how did you lay down the, sorry, I, I, the right picture that you have in the cover of the right? I'm gonna talk about that. Oh, okay, I'll shut up. Okay. <laughs> How do you keep your returns at the June 8th level? How do you keep the returns here? Well, now yeah, once you're again... You're still getting full of value of nutrients there, but I mean, as the year goes down, then you're at $100, but is there a way to keep your levels... So all this is going to beans, and so this is terminated out, and... and like that's by having to cover in with your crop, this kind of thing? Or, yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, you look at some of Jay's relay cropping, intercropping, multiple species cropping. That's the native way. The prairie, ne nowhere in this planet can you go and find a natural system that's just growing a tree, all pines, or all big blue grass, or all buffalo grass. There's hundreds and hundreds of species growing together. And that's, that's the, when we talk about mimicking nature, it's putting it all together and growing it all together. That's the future. That's one of the things that Jay was talking about today. As we look into the future of how we farm, it's going to be through ways like this. So the power of cocktails has made. This is that soil in Tennessee. 
Once I pull that bottle mass and they roller crimp that down, they drill through it and then come back before the crop emerged and rolled it down. And I tell everybody, if Ray Charles was looking at this, <laughs> where's the water going to go if it comes a four inch rain today? In. In. So when I say I get it all, it's because of this. So what did you do with the right? Did you cut it or you just mow it and flatten and roll it in and that was it? That, no, it roll or crimp it. Okay. You don't want to mow it. So I'll tell you a story. I was, I was going to tell Jay this a while ago. There's a big dairy farm in Oklahoma called Brahms. And they have lots of, of, of stores where they sell ice cream and hamburgers and everything. And milk and everything in there. <clears throat> Out northwest of me, they had 20 some thousand acres. They had 128 pivots on it. Two, three years ago, this coming spring, it was like a little Sahara. It's really sandy out there. They got a lot of water under to pump on. But they were a take all because they, you know, I worked on a dairy farm, so I can say this. Anything that was sticking up, we either wanted to hay it, bale it, graze it, chop it because it went into the cows. That's where they were at. And it was blowing away. And Jim asked me, I knew the, the farm manager out there. I knew his dad really well. I said, you gotta plant a cover crop, man. You can't keep farming as sand or you're gonna have a desert. And he said, okay, okay. Uh, what do I need to do? I said, just plant some cereal rye. Just a baby step. Don't worry about the all the mix and everything, just start. <coughs> Plant you about 70, 80 pounds, 90 pounds of rye right now behind the combine. <coughs> Didn't hear any more from him until the spring. And we were having ag day at, at, at the Capitol and my phone started buzzing and I didn't answer it and buzz and get a look at it. Christine sent me a text message, you're gonna get me fired if you don't answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, what's, what's going on? He said, Houston, we got a problem. I can't plant through that rye. The biomass is too much. I can't plant through it. I said, okay, tell me what's going on with the planter. You know, you got row cleaners, you need to raise them up or take them off. You got this. He said, you're not listening. You're not listening. I can't plant through it. I said, well, Jim, tell me what the problem is and let's work through this. This is what I like to do. I said, what's the problem? He says, the, the damn windrows. What he said. That's fine. Oh, oh windrows. What windrows? Yeah, what, what's causing the windrows? He said, I'm mowing it. And I said, stop. He said, we did. We started to disc it. But I got to disc it four times to get the plant through it. Okay. Back up, Jim. What's wrong with the planter? Why can't you plant through it? That's what I heard. I said, have you tried it? He said, oh, no, Jimmy, I can't get through it. It's six foot tall. It's so thick. I can't walk through it. I said, oh, my God, that's perfect. It's perfect. He said, it's hell. And I said, pull across into the next field because they're all continuous. It's it's perfect farm. And go to plant. And in the meantime, I see him videos like you were talking about, Jay, from Russell, from Adam, showing cover crops, planting right straight through it green. In about an hour, I got a video from him. They have a 92 foot wide planter, 48 rows, and they're just six mile an hour. Just beautiful. I mean, that rye was. And so I called him and said, man, what's the problem? He said, man, there ain't no problem. He said, I never dreamed about this. And I said, well, how much water did you put on to get that much biomass that quick? You planted 80, 90 pounds. He said, well, uh, maybe I didn't do everything you said. I said, what's the deal? He said, well, we bought the rye. It was unclean. We couldn't get through the drill. So we broadcast that at 145 pounds and run a vertical till about that deep. And then we poured the water to it. Which was exactly what they needed to do. Perfect scenario. So they roller crimp this down. And that's what these guys do. Now once again, Jay and I can't hardly roller crimp 
because we can't get it tall enough and, and, and have that hollow stem enough to terminate it. There is issues yeah. about that. It's not this perfect. Can I, can I follow up on that? Yeah. With the roller crimper. Part of the thing that we need to be looking at is understanding why tools work the way they work. And the reason that the roller crimper tool works the way that it works as opposed to mowing it is the idea is, is that, you know, not just, you know, you've got sort of a hollow stem, but the whole idea is that you want to wait till the rise at a certain stage or the vetch or whatever you're using that you're going to roll down until it's at a certain reproductive stage so that most of the carbon is up here and the resources they need, the plant needs are in the soil. To get those resources from the microbiology, you got to pay carbon. If you put a whole bunch of crimps between where the carbon is and where the resources need to be gained, that's going to mean that there's not enough carbon to be able to get past all of those crimps to pay all of the microbes to get all of the resources you need to be able to regrow. <coughs> so if you don't roll it at the right time, it doesn't, it's not effective. However, we're going to fool the plant. So one of the ways in which you can fool the plant when you can't wait till reproductive, because, you know, Jimmy's in Oklahoma, Jay is in North Dakota, but that's still not Canada, for God's sake, <laughs> right? <laughs> Seriously. So what we gotta, what we got to think about is how can we fool the plant? We need to get the carbon here and keep it away from where the, the nutrients are. So what you want to do is even if it's not at the reproductive phase, go ahead and roll it. And then that's going to put all of those crimps in there and all of those bends. There's going to be carbon near the crown roots that's going to be able to pay for regrowth, cover all those wounds, pay for regrowth, all of that kind of stuff. Give it, you know, at least three, probably five days or so until it starts shooting back up again. Go out there and roll it again. Now, you don't want to roll in exactly the same direction again. So you can either roll in a perpendicular direction or you can roll at an angle. But the whole idea is if you roll in the same direction, you're going to put brakes in the same spot. And it already built the resilience in the wall, the cell walls, so that if you put the brakes in the same spot, it's not going to hurt it that much. You want to put new brakes in a different spot. Now, the reason mowing doesn't work is it's a wound pattern issue. If you mow, you just slice something off. And so the amount of resources you need as a plant to put, build the antioxidants, to rebuild your cell walls, to close off the dead cells, all of that stuff, the amount you need is very little because there's just one slice through your leaf and stem. Mm -hmm. But if you have all of those crimps, if you have all of those little bends in there, all of the damage to so many of the plant cells, that's going to take a lot more resources. So again, when we understand why these tools work and why they don't work, you got to think about what tool you can use to make it work effectively for the conditions you're existing in. Doesn't mean that mowing's not going to work. You just may have to approach mowing differently or use a different type of a mower that's going to have a different wound pattern or put it at, cut it at different heights multiple times in order to be able to get that to work. It's all in thinking, again, about how does, why do these things work, and then how can I go and actually apply that knowledge to get it to be effective for me. Yep. I couldn't say it better. <laughs> I mean, it's just trial or, yep. So, if you're putting into the rye after you terminate it, are you, like, is it not having any of that, um, Yeah, effect afterwards? We haven't seen, so there have been some conditions with allelopathy and some issues with allelopathy. Um, and one of the things, the allelopathic chemicals that are made, they're really small as far as their molecular size, and they're fairly easy to decompose or to leach out of the system. So they can, they're mobile and they can move away and they're not going to last for very long. When I've worked with some growers that, where they have some issues with allelopathy is if it's really dry, and then you're trying to go back in there and you just don't have the capability for the microbes to be growing very actively to break down those allelopathic chemicals, 
and you don't have the moisture to help to flush those out of the rhizosphere, then you can run into those issues. But for the most part, I've not seen it be an issue, again, if you think about what it is that you could do for being able to manage that. I don't so, know if you've seen something different, Jimmy. Yeah, and, and a lot of these growers in that other scenario will not roll or crimp until that, that bean is up to this big or so, because until the growing point gets above the ground, you can roll it down and they'll stand right back up. Mm -hmm. And so you can get around that in them conditions when, when that's uh, prevalent. Yeah, they'll plant directly into it and then roll it after it yep. comes up. Yep. Yep. So, and, and, and I've seen some aggregations, uh, aggregates on the uh, phone here just a minute ago. When you look at this soil under magnification in the field, this is what, this is the surface. So I got a, a, a proscope that goes onto my phone that magnifies the surface. And so I took this picture and just set it down on there and took this picture. When you talk about gas flow and air flow, if you're working below the ground, you gotta have oxygen, but you also gotta get rid of CO2 because you can't breathe CO2 in all the time either. So you gotta have that gas flow. So that's the reason this soil works very good. So now I'm gonna walk out of this field about 100 feet into the neighbor's field. And this is his field of beans. I'm standing in between the rows. They're good beans. They're about this tall, and I erased the picture by accident, and I can't get it back. <laughs> <laughs> Not perfect, but look at the weed pressure that's fixing to be a real problem. And I'm gonna zone in right here. This is the surface. So if it rains three inches in this, the same field today, where's the water gonna go? It's not gonna go in. What happens if we'd sprayed a chemical or put synthetic fertilizer on that downstream? So if you zoom in on that, looks like the moon almost. People tell me that, you know, you sure that's the same? Yeah, it is, it's the same. So if you look at both of these soils side by side, you see a very active soil. Look at all the roots. They tell you that, that soil beans don't have a lot of roots on them. If you feed them and have the nutrients, they will come. And if you don't, they won't. But once again, everybody tells me, well, Jimmy, that's in a 60-inch rainfall. That won't work here. I've heard it won't work here so many, uh, 200 times this year. So I went back home. Before you leave that photo, can you go back for a second, Jimmy? Yeah. So you got a nodule right there, and that nodule is not on your taproot, which is actually a nice thing. Because mm -hmm. you don't want that nodule to be on your taproot. A lot of times you pull up your bean plants, and you'll just you'll see these nice big nodules and be all excited about it, but they're just on the taproot. You want to have the nodules that are going to be out here on the rest of the roots that yeah. are out there. Good point. So I came back to Oklahoma. Everybody said Oklahoma red dirt. It's true. This is my neighbor. This is the take all guy. This is my neighbor, my best friend, or me. This is actually my soil. <coughs> you want to look at the sand particles in here. You can see the characteristics of all this in here, except no carbon, very little or an abundance. So when we harvest, we plant, we like that armor, keep it the best we can. We're going to plant a multiple species cover crop. This was one year that we had water. You always want to grow all you can grow. So when you're blessed with water, grow all you can grow and store all you can. We're going to graze it because I'm a cattleman. We're going to use a poly wire. Now, I don't mow. My wife wants to mow. So when I'm gone, guess what? We mow the path. <laughs> That's okay. That's how we get along. <laughs> uh, anymore, I drag a truck tire behind the four-wheeler. 
just lay it down a little bit uh, with that. And I could do that relatively quick. Once again, these plants are in reproductive mode while we're grazing. They're going to use more water. But I'm making pounds of beef right quickly. And we'll, we'll do stock density rates pretty high at times when I'm home, when I can. We operate about 2,000 acres of farm ground, about 5,000 acres of rangeland with my wife and one hired hand and me. It's gone a lot. So they're, they're pretty amazing. When we get done, we had this conversation earlier about leaving some standing residue. There's a big debate that I'm wasting nutrients by leaving all this standing up and letting that oxidize standing there. And uh, I don't believe uh, in that because, first of all, I believe in the science of it. But I want, this is going into fall. And when we get a snow, like y'all do, guess what? This wind comes with the snow. Very seldom we get a perfect snow. So I want some of that still standing, but yet I want armor on the soil to protect it. And then I want to just open that up and drop a seed in it and close it up. Now we're going to get into the real deal here of the measurements. So I have two center pivots is all I've got. The dry land is everything else. The pivot is coming towards me in these beans. <clears throat> I'm putting on two inches of water out the pivot. And I've had the irrigator say, you can't do that because it'll run out of the field. And I said, yeah, I, I know it will with you. This is not you. I've worked on my soil. The amazing thing about this photograph is it rained two and a half inches during the night. And I went down here to shut the pivot off. And what do you see? See any standing water? Any run, running off water? No. So we better, we better look at this more in depth. So I called the team, soil scientist, soil scientist, my camera lady, the local gal does a great job doing photos for us, and the new intern with NRCS. So we parked the pivot, anchored it down, it's not going anywhere, we put GoPro cameras out here, and I put seven inches of water on in this field in an hour and 40 minutes. Pretty nice little rain. Mm -hmm. Shut the pivot off, and this is what it was, the rain gauge is come full. There was a little standing water right there. This is literally as soon as we shut it off. This is a four foot wagon ring that we adapted to make a big infiltration ring. Straight down. The soil scientists dug in, in that field that day. Water moved down about five feet within about three hours. Very liquid in the bottom, but not in the top. He says, we could have took in more. So the next project is, we're gonna see how much we can really put on. And I couldn't have done it, without a soil scientist, a soil scientist, and a soil scientist, and document it here. This, this is our, our field along the river, where my, grand, my granddad, actually, the Great Western Cattle Trail come through that notch right there. Uh, and we, we always enjoy going up there and looking down in the valley. I want you to look right here. See that line? More carbon. Or I can give you a better picture. This is what the surface look, used to look like. It was redder than that, more sandier. You can see the mixing going on now with the earthworms still down in here. You see them pockets of brown. It's not always this defined layer because they're always mixing for you. That's the reason there's still some red up here where they're, that's earthworm burrows. They're bringing some up and <coughs> taking some down. They've actually changed the classification of the soil in this field in our CS. The original soil survey mapped this as a used to flu bent. These are very young soils, about 500 years old, they tell me. Typically, they didn't have a very dark surface in, in this field that I saw eight years ago, my soil scientist, Steve. Today, I see a dark soil we now call mollic. 
uh, which can be reclassified as if we picked half the soil. It's a game changer. It's a game changer in what I can do on that soil. And what does that really mean? Well, there's more to the pie than just the crust. <coughs> my mom always used to talk about, oh, my, my crust is so flaky. And she's so proud of her crust. I said, Mom, I don't care about the crust. <laughs> <laughs> I want the filling. <laughs> but we got to have both. So how important is soil aggregation to soil health? Well, literally, it's everything, beginning with improved infiltration, water holding capacity, carbon storage, and more nutrients. If we get an 8 to 10 inch rainfall event, we can take it all in, or at least most of it, depending on how full your profile is. This provides multiple benefits. One, future growth, water to grow crops, nutrients stay in the field instead of downstream, and the soil stays in place. That's the game changer. If you look at this field, we had a field day. This is Russ Jackson in southwest Oklahoma. I've been working with Russ now about seven years, I think. We had a field day three days before this rainfall event, and we measured his water infiltration all over this field. This is a cover crop field right now at six inches per hour. And now that ranges. Some of it was four inches, some of it was 10 inches, some of it was three, but on the average, it was six inches. Russ took this picture, he called me, he said, you can't believe what I'm seeing. The neighbor over here with full tillage just one crop, mono crop of wheat, is flooded, and I have no standing water. I said, well, how much did it rain, Russ? Well, 5.3 inches. Because of his management system of cover crops and grazing and, and rotation, at 6 inches an hour, he could take in almost 144,000 gallons. The neighbor, this single cropping system, no cattle, no nothing, only had a half inch an hour where I used to be. Can only get 16,500 gallons. So, crop insurance. Who's the best bet in making a crop in the future? <coughs> Things to think about. So, guess what happened two weeks later? You see any difference in the photograph? If you look over here, see how much greener it is? Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, more water over here. A little dab of standing water, because it was still raining. You see raindrops on the windshield here. Russ took this picture and sent to me. And I just couldn't stand it. I hopped in the pickup and went the next morning. This is in the morning. I'm in my pickup now. Water is still running out of this field, down through this tin horn, through this tin horn, into the creek. The neighbor lives here. Russ's dad lives here. And every time I show this, everybody said, well, how come this guy can't walk across that road and say, what in the world are you doing here? <laughs> All my water's leaving, and some soil, and yours is not. That's the $100,000 question. You turn around, look the other way, if it rains this afternoon, Chris, where's the water going to go? Back down the stream. Because it's crusted over. It's a nice little water. river there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and guess what's in the river? Chocolate milk. If you look across the road, and Russ is going to cotton in this field and raised a whale of a cotton crop that year. And the neighbor just was so-so. His wheat crop is just kind of the way it always is. So, everybody says you can't do it here. This happened this summer in Mino, Oklahoma. My friend here, Mark Thomas, on this side of the road. The neighbor's here. I've got a better shot since the clouds got out of the way. He's got triticale coming up in this cover. This guy was harrowing the day before when I was up there. He never did get to plant this field, by the way. It was either blowing away or it was too wet to get in there. Water from Mark's field versus the neighbor's. Jay said he did drive through the Red River Valley on the way to uh, 
uh, Fargo, only in the night. Well, this is our friend up there, Michael Larsons. Michael's been two, three years, maybe four now. Time flies when you're having fun. Or the typical way. Still a little standing water here. Actually, this water is coming through a culvert in the road down here. It's not coming out of here. This next one is from Jeremy Wilson at uh, uh, James, Jamestown, North Dakota. Uh, this past year, it rained all day, like 12 and a half, 13 inches. And if you notice, it's rained, it's rained all day and hailed five of them hours. Now, it swept away residue. Some of my poor residue fields. But there's no ditch to speak of. It and hold it. That's clear runoff. Look how clear that is. Now watch it here. <laughs> Pretty sweet. <laughs> Tastes really good. <laughs> yeah. That's what we can do if things are aggregated and working right. Can we hold a flood? No. Can't be done. Can we hold a lot of it? Yeah, we can. And we can build resilience. So, my Milo this summer versus my neighbors that didn't head, neither field headed, by the way. But once again, remember Jay's photos when talked about Pretty green, it's struggling, but not as bad as that. Michael Thompson in northeast Can or northwest Kansas on the Nebraska line, neighbors, Michaels. Michaels, the neighbor. It didn't rain on this side of the field and not on this side of the field. <laughs> Was this a good crop? No, much like Jay's, it was in that 50, 45 to 55 bushel range of insurance adjusted it. Michael then turned around and grazed that, strip grazed it, and is feeding the cows this winter for virtually nothing. We can plant green when we have water. This is actually us. So it, actually the air seeder does a pretty good job of laying that down. We can come back with a crimper and finish it off. But you notice it's headed, it's flowering. So it, it's pretty easy to do that then. You have to do it at that stage. This is one of the wet years. Pretty nice rye. This is uh, this year struggling. See a little bare soil here? Really? I mean, it was like this tall and we were lucky to get that. It's all about the residue. So we're going to quickly look at a field in 18 months on my part <coughs> because the time is now to do it, folks. Trust me. We can either just do nothing because it is impossible. And I'll tell you, the only thing that's impossible is the things that you don't try. Or we can just do it. Nothing is impossible. Will we have failures? They're learning moments. I'm like Rick Clark. I don't like the word failure. They're learning opportunities. <laughs> Sometimes they're expensive learning opportunities. But at home, everybody wants to grow winter wheat and then leave it fallow about 25 or 30% of the year. And bear it. I want it. Do I always get that? There's a little struggle in the drought, I'll just tell you. So we're going to plant cereal rye for harvest. But I'm going to plant diversity in there. Lots of diversity. But once again, I am a cattleman. So I want to see, and in Oklahoma, we can graze this in the wintertime, November, December, January, February. We've got to take off the last of February if we're going to harvest it. Some guys will go February 15th, March 1st, but they hurt their yield. And they got to outweigh the get the gain the gain on the cattle versus the grain. You saw this just a minute ago. 
We harvest this grain about 38 bushel an acre on Elbon Rye. That's just Elbon. Just, if you push it more than that, it's going to lay down on you. But once again, it's a good seed crop that's going to a seed house for us. I'll show you the, the economics here in a minute. What are we going to do on July 15th when we harvest this? Is we're going to plant something. And I'm going to plant corn. Double crop corn. There's, there's multiple reasons I, I did. I, first of all, I've done this on the double dog dare. Any of y'all ever done a double dog dare? <laughs> said, Jimmy, you can't do this. I said, okay, game on. So I called my seed dealer, and he calls me his worst nightmare. He's like, hey, I'm thinking about planting some corn. You got some seed? He says, it's July 15th, Jimmy. I said, yeah, I need a 100-day or less corn. He said, have I got a deal for you? And I said, I also want it naked. And I want it non-GMO. Have I got a deal for you? And I said, that's what I want to hear. So ordered seed. I planted that. Now, remember what Jay said a while ago. Corn doesn't like competition when it's small. And I got some friends that has been trying to plant into green, and it just doesn't play very well. Dan DeSutter is one in Indiana that's tried this. I told Dan, I said, I got the answer to you. All you got to do is harvest the rye and plant the corn, and it loves it. It really loves it. The other reason I want to do this is if I plant corn early, we're going to pollinate in the middle of the heat season in Oklahoma. And we're not, we'll be in the hundreds, and we'll not get below 80, 85 at night. And pollination is horrible if you do that. That's the reason nobody raises it. Plus, you stress the corn out. And aflatoxin is a big issue. I've done this multiple times. I have no aflatoxin issues whatsoever because I keep it healthy. Even, even the grasshoppers and stuff like it once in a while. Spray a little molasses and sugars over the top. You can take care of that problem. They can't handle sugar. Had a good friend of mine this summer had tomatoes in his garden and, and some other plants and they were just eating the fire out of it. I said, get you some sugar and melt it down and spray it on there. He's like, yeah, I knew you was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I am. I am. You try that and let me know. And his wife told me a week later, I said, holy cow, they're, they're, they left. I said, yeah, they can't eat it. They can't digest it. You either killed them or they left. One thing that I done with the combine, though, was I threw some grain out the back when we harvested the cereal rye on purpose. I didn't have a gleaner. The silver cedar. The silver cedar. It's, a, it's an inside joke. But this is why I done that. So I want something green growing quickly after I plant it. And I don't want to plant it because I don't have a, co a, a planter, so I got to hire it done. And I don't have an interseeder yet. I don't like all them moving parts of iron. So I want to do it the natural way. This corn has zero inputs other than a compost tea extract, molasses, humix, and some dissolved urea is the only synthetic that I put in that. It's 16 units. Look at that corn. Very healthy. We done that over the top. We treated the seed as we was planting it about eight, in, eight ounces for 70 pounds of seed of that product on the seed. We want to do in furrow like Jay's done. We just haven't got this, everything set up yet. That's the next project. See, Dr. Haney looked at Illinois at the data. And they were trying to figure out where the curve on nitrogen, corn yield over here in pounds of N per acre, where the optimum curve was. And Rick kept telling them, well, what about over here? Zero can raise 50 to 160 bushels with nothing. So if you put a little on, you can really get, get that up there. But you don't have to. 
You can put more on, but I'm a low input guy. But I'm a cattleman. So what does this all mean in 18 months? Here's the finale of it. So the bio stems that I put on for 18 months runs about 50 bucks an acre. And I'm buying some of that compost tea. I'm not brewing it or vermicast. I'm having to buy that, but then I'm mixing everything else myself. Planting of the rye seed, the care and fence of the cattle, harvested the rye, planted the corn, harvested the corn, and, and you can adjust that however you think I'm high or low, or low, you can add, I don't care. You can go over here where I grazed the cereal rye, I took $432 an acre of beef in the fall and spring from my kids in this trial <coughs> off the ranch. I sold the rye seed for 10 cents a pound, another $200 an acre. The corn, we measured the corn yield at about 140, but I got feral pigs out the wazoo. Mm -hmm. On that 130 acres, we killed 410 pigs that fall. They make good compost, by the way. <laughs> uh, so I only got uh, 110 bushel in the truck from the pigs. Still 550 bucks an acre. Then I grazed it. 600 bucks an acre. And everybody says, Jimmy, you done the math wrong. Well, my banker double checked them figures. What happened, with the drought was going in, on in Texas, and I had a friend down there who was going to have to sell his calf crop. And the, the calves were extremely thin. They were healthy, but they were extremely thin. And so I knew I had some good forage for them, and I bought them calves. And the compensatory gain was just out, unbelievable. Yeah. Four pounds a day through the duration. And the health was good. I marketed them calves. Tremendous opportunity. Tremendous opportunity. So, you know, you take that, once again, you can change in numbers, but I can be very profitable to do that. Now I'm going to, Kelly, where did Kelly go? I'm going to transition to the next phase right into to Chris's talk. Long live the soil, our lives depend on it. You know, you're talking about the soils of, of overseas and, and how long they've been farming it. Remember the Roman Empire. If you ever have a chance to go to Italy and see what them engineers could build, it's just, it's just mind blowing. But they ruined their soils and they just kept spreading out. They got further and further away from the castle of the kingdom trying to feed their, their people and the people were mad and angry and they kept ruining their souls and they couldn't feed everybody so when the barbarians come along they overrun them quickly. Some of the greatest engineers in the world. So how did I do it? Biology. Biology, biology, biology. You got to figure that out. I, Twelve years ago I knew nothing. I know a little more. A little. We thought we had it figured out years ago, and we thought we had like 20 or 30% figured out below ground. Well, we got the decimal point in the wrong spot. <laughs> so we are always looking below ground because you can't grow anything above ground if you don't have something below ground to do it in. My grandson is just infatuated with earthworms and learning more. And I do have some people I rely on. I don't know if you know this guy. Jay's helped me immensely. Learning. I'm in Delaware in the middle of winter in a snowstorm up there, and look how shallow that earthworm is working. People will tell you you won't have earthworms in the wintertime. Now up here, it's a little different. It's a little colder than Delaware. But they will survive. The eggs and the, and the youth will survive, and they, they can come back. You got to look at the roots, and you got to look at the aggregation. And by the way, when you pull a root that has 
dreadlocks on it, it'll strip it right off, by the way, and you'll turn it white. But really, this is what you want to look like. This is from my farm. The sand, remember? Sandy, sandy loam. If you see the yellow here, that's kind of a, a sure tail that, that you got that mycorrhizal fungi working in there too as well. Once again, our soil scientist, this is at Tom Cannon's. Look at the difference here. Tom's been doing this a long time. Very good soil, very good soil. But you always got to look below ground. So it was very warm that day, even though it, it's a little, little overcast. We're in the <coughs> mid 90s to 100 degrees. And when we got in this pit, it was like 60, 65 degrees. Like you said a while ago, it's just like a cooling effect to walk down in there. Mixing of the soil, the aggregation, the gas flow, and the air flow. This next set, this is an Elbon uh, rye root growing across an earthworm burrow in the ground. And when I took this first picture with my proscope, I, I said, man, look at them water droplets. It looks like dew. What do we call them? Exudates. You heard that word? We don't get to see them because normally it's surrounded by soil. What feeds the biology? And so I was so excited. I kept trying to get in closer. The hairs and the roots is just so thick coming out of that and all the particles. But I finally zoomed in and got a really good picture of what root exudates really looked like. What I should have done was took that back to the house and put it under a microscope and look deeper. But I don't always think of that. This is what you, what you can really learn when you look below the ground, when it's really active. When it gets dry, they're going to cocoon up, and, and they're going and they'll do this in the winter time too. Pot worms, you can see the soil he's eating, going down through here, and actually, these two are making more. Oop, what happened here? <laughs> Video's not going to work. But they're actually making more worms. Don't normally show pornographic things. So. <laughs> I guess we won't. So, feeding the soil. Biological stimulants on the seed and in furrow can improve the activity. You heard it from Jay. We know that now. And that's where we're, that's our next big frontier is in furrow. We've been putting it on the seed. We've been using it foliar because them's the tools that I done had. To put it on my drill, if I hired somebody to do that today, it's about 18,000 bucks. So I want to do it for about five or 6,000 myself or less. And I'll get that done this year. Now we talked about dissolving urea, dried urea. This is the third attempt of this. This is the water heater I'm building. To start with, I used bigger tubing, and I moved it to there too, too quickly. In this photograph, there's 60 foot of tubing down this barrel I made, inlet here and outlet down on the end, and then we're gonna shoot a flame down the middle here. Now, I have another 80 foot of tubing, and then coils are a lot closer in there so I can heat the water. Because to dissolve urea, there's a big chemical reaction that happens and, and you have this big cooling effect. If you ever want a Dr. Pepper cold or an adult beverage cold, you can do that right quick. Put a little urea in some water around it because it will get cold. We gotta have the water at 85 degrees or warmer. You can do it when it's a little cooler than that, but slower. And I have froze things up. I was telling Chris earlier about my higher dam froze up the first time while I went to town. And then I done it one evening when the clouds come up and started cooling off in the fall. We really like to do this in the summertime when the ambient temperature is 100. We don't have to spend much to keep the water cold. Because as you're pouring that, that urea in here, it's a cooling effect happening. 
So you got to keep the fire on. This is the orifice. I took a grease cert and took the ball and spring out of it. Shoot flame in there, not modified. This I'm on like model well, probably seven now uh, to get it perfected. But I can take 60 units of dry fertilizer and I can liquefy it and I can use 16 and get the same results. So if I'm buying that, that urea at a dollar a pound, instead of $60 an acre, I can do it for 16. And it doesn't take much to stimulate biology a little bit. Once again, you don't want to overdo it because you will shut them down. But I'm also got an inductor, got molasses here, because I want carbohydrates and I want sugar in it. I want to feed and I want humix to go in as well to build the house for it. This is kind of my simplified version of nine gallons <coughs> of water per acre, quart of humix, sulfur, because we don't have the sulfur anymore. You're not, you're not taking that picture of me, Your hat got Yeah. Uh, 42 pounds of urea, one to two quarts of molasses, the mat. This, this extract tea, it, we've upped that a little bit. Now, and we're going to put that on about 10 and a half gallon an acre rate. And we, we continue to modify and change this a little. This was actually John Kemp's original mix he shared with me. But he didn't tell me the order to put this in. There is an order that you have to go through or it won't work. And I had a chemist in Kansas, a friend of mine, said that it doesn't matter because the chemistry says this, this, and this, this, and science <laughs> says this, this. I said, okay, well, I'm going to tell you, Kemp, give me the, the, the ingredients, not the order. He said, you can figure it out. <laughs> Power to you. <clears throat> Trial and error, I figured it out. So my friend done it the wrong way because he said the chemistry didn't, didn't work. And he had cottage cheese and a big mess. And he found out that he had to do it the right way. Once you do that, you saw this picture a while ago. So is that foliar or in a furrow that you're doing that? Uh... So we won't do it all. So Jay's done a great trial. That, one of the reasons I was up at Minokin was to talk, but also to learn. So he had corn growing with the check area, then he had corn growing within, on the seed applied, then he had seed applied and then furrow. In the middle of the drought, I could only push a shovel in beside that corn plant about four inches with one hand. When I moved over to in furrow, it's about seven or eight inches, and I'm talking just, just over two or three rows, three or four rows. In furrow and on the seed, I can almost push it in all the way. But it gets back to the biology is respiring water vapor more than anything. And the more activity you got in that seed zone, the more water available that you got. It's not, you can't, you can't dig it up and say, ooh, I got this much. But a little below ground at the seed, when it's starting, and we all know how important the first few days is, that's where you can really make a difference. And then come back over the top foliar. We really like that as well. And you saw these pictures. So, now we're going to take the microscope. And I went up to Michael Thompson's uh, in Kansas, and Candy Thomas with NRCS got a really nice setup with this, and Chris, you may have to help me through this a little bit. Um, so this guy is a high input. You'd love to loan him money, by the way, because he would need no limits, because he wants the pounds to yield. For him, it's all about yield. So when you put a microscope on this, this is the activity he, he has. 
Oh, there was one. We're looking. You see a little bit moving. Chris, what would you say in that activity wise? You know, there's, there, first off, there's not a lot of diversity. You, you've got diversity a little bit within the bacteria. So all the little dots there that are moving, just mm -hmm. little teeny tiny ones. Those are mostly the bacteria that are there, and you get some diversity there. You've got a couple of ciliates, but you don't have much in, of anything else. Right. You've got a couple of fragments of hyphae here and there, but nothing that's really moving she or intact. She said. Yeah. She said. <laughs> so, now we're going to go over to another neighbor down the road that is <coughs> guy Jay. But he's high inputs still because it's about to yield. Batter system, he's took a first good step going no-till. <coughs> Getting focused in here in a minute. There we go. See any difference? You got to remember, when you go to a no-till system, you're not putting a tornado below the ground. When a tornado comes along, it tears the infrastructure up and kills everything in its path. Same way as the tillage. So if you're below ground working here for us, you're in trouble. Chris, see a little bit more activity here. See a little bit more activity, but again, it's bacterially dominated. Not much else other than bacteria. Come on up here if you don't see. I haven't seen a silly yet. Yeah. Um, I see some bits of organic matter, but not there's not really a lot of fungi or anything there. Right. Just a lot of bacteria. And what do we want in soil? It's not bacteria all the time. We want fungal. Mm -hmm. We're not getting that here. So we're going to go down the road a little bit further. No-till with cover crops. This guy's doing better. He's took another step. You know, we're moving forward. And this is all within a 10-mile, 12-mile range, surfing, of Alameda, Kansas. Now what do you see, Chris? Got a lot of ciliates there. We got some flagellates. Got, yeah, so. The middle. No, no. Okay, so yeah, ciliates there, flagellates that are there. Obviously, we've got we still got some bacteria that are there. Um, you know, the hyphae, it's hard to be able to see the hyphae. It doesn't move around. It's not very exciting all the time, but might have a present of hyphae there. I think there's yeah. a little. There's a little bit that's in yeah. there. Yeah. So, better. 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 Yeah, click it again on the right. Okay. That, that's still the same slide. Yep. A lot more activity, though. Be there, but a lot more activity, yep. When you're talking about water, there's a lot more water here. Yep. So now, no-till with cover crops plus grazing. The ultimate. Almost. <clears throat> A lot more activity. Yeah. A little more hyphae in this one. So the ciliates and the flagellates, they're eating the bacteria. That's their food. And mm -hmm. the, the good thing about having those in the system is they eat the bacteria and then their waste product is like any waste product from any organism, it's nutrients. Woohoo! So that you don't have to buy. That you don't buy. So that's your <laughs> that's your nitrogen that's there. It's primarily a lot of nitrogen that you're gonna get. Now we're gonna come back to Michael's multiple years of a full health, soil health systems with everything. Cattle, multiple crops, managed grazing, uh, intercropping, companion cropping. In an arid environment, now it's northwest Kansas, right next to Nebraska and Colorado, just right to the west. Our first nematode. Yep. Let's 
see some more high feet. I tell everybody this is like the Beijing of the underground. <laughs> and the first slide was leading where I live. We don't have a stoplight. We do have a stop sign. If these are your friends and they are freeing the minerals up and turning them into amino acids so your plants can take them up and grow, do you want more of these or less of these? You want this, is what you want. And so that's my perspective from the farmer side of what I've learned in the last 12 years that I was over here. And now I'm going to be here, and I am here in a lot, and Michael's done a great job. This is a, when, when you say the soil is alive, this is the picture of, a, of alive. Back that up again. Yeah. I think you're a lovely assistant. <laughs> you know, they're eating the bacteria. There's more fungal component in here. There's more population. There's more water, it's more fluid. You can see that in this picture, the activity. And I'm gonna quit there, because uh, Chris is gonna take you to another level now. You remember, I'm in the middle here. I'm the guy that's trying everything that this guy and this lady says we need to do. And that's the practical applications on the ground, of what we can do. And I don't know if you wanna I don't know where we're at in time. Take a break or yeah. roll right in, Chris. Yeah. Yep, fill your yeah. coffee cups, take a break, and up next is Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.